He is the founder and chairman of the Asian American and Pacific Islanders Victory Fund headquartered in Washington, D.C. I have a sense of mission and purpose that is well beyond uh, just doing well for myself and my family. He is a successful entrepreneur and a venture capitalist and serves on the board of the Democracy Alliance. Why are we just writing checks instead of asking for things, instead of engaging more, instead of getting our children involved in the campaigns? And why aren't we seeing more Indian Americans in public office? NewsX proudly presents the Vaku Diaspora Dialogue with Shekhar Narsimhan. Well, hello and welcome. You're watching News X Waku. My name is Megha and joining me on the broadcast today is Shekhar Narsimhan. He's the chairman and founder of AAPI Victory Fund, which aims to mobilize the Asian American Pacific Islander community in the United States. He is also the managing partner at Beacom Advisors and he serves as a board member for the Democracy Alliance, amongst other things. It's good to have you, Shekhar, on the broadcast with us. Very nice to have to meet you, Megha, and congratulations on your new show. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, my first question, and I ask uh, all the members of the diaspora community who join me on the broadcast uh, to narrate your tale of the American dream that you had envisaged for yourself when you first decided to move from India uh, to United States. <laughs> I think it's probably fairly similar, actually, in my generation. Um, I came to the United States in 1974 after going to IIT Delhi. I think about 80% of my class batchmates at that time actually came overseas to study somewhere, mostly in the US. And um, I did an MBA. And then my path took a different direction. Um, I had always had a very deep interest and I consider myself extraordinarily fortunate for this um, in community development, um, in doing something about poverty. And uh, many people in India laughed at me about doing something about poverty in the United States when in India in 1974, there was obviously significant poverty um, as there is even today. And, uh, but I got lucky. I ended up in a place uh, called Eastern Kentucky where the, uh, literally many of them had never seen and an Indian from India uh, before. I was taken at face value. I worked in community development in low-income communities, um, came to Washington. So it's the standard story, except for that little interregnum where I debated returning to India to do the same work, concluded I would be more effective here, but learned one incredible lesson before I went into private, uh, the private sector. I went into property management of homes, uh, banking, and then I stayed in banking the rest of my life. Last 33 years running a publicly traded commercial real estate finance company and now an investment bank. So the entrepreneurial story has drifted because I got a, I have a very deep seated mission in all that I do. I care deeply about making sure that everybody in the world who needs it has decent, safe, and sanitary shelter. Mm -hmm. And so I work on affordable housing issues in a business. I've used every platform that I've been on to talk about the importance and drive that we have to have adequate shelter in every place in the world that I can think of and I go to. So that connectivity, I consider myself just beyond fortunate. Yes, I we have the American dream in the traditional senses of you know, we have two cars and we have a house and <laughs> we have children that have done well and we have prospered here. But it is that I have a sense of mission and purpose that is well beyond um, just doing well for myself and my family. Okay. And, and is that uh, what compelled you to actually found AAPI Victory Fund? Uh, tell the backstory over there. <laughs> um, there's, there's always a backstory, as you know. So in 2004, I started to get engaged in American politics in a direct way and was asked uh, by the then chair of the DNC to co-chair a committee, which became the first, it was called the Indo-American Indo Democratic Leadership Council. And it was asked to co-chair this to help activate Indian Americans, but predominantly to write checks to democratic candidates. Mm -hmm. And that little experience taught me, why are we just writing checks 
instead of asking for things, instead of engaging more, instead of getting our children involved in the campaigns? And why aren't we seeing more Indian Americans in public office? Because the way you set up role modeling is people like you, young people like you achieve things and you are seen and people say, I would like to be like that. Just like Kamala Harris is a role model for many people, South Asians, uh, African-Americans and women. So I just said, okay, what can I do that would actually be a game changer in American politics? The fastest growing ethnic communities in the United States are Asian American Pacific Islander. They, we are growing faster than any other group, faster than uh, you know the Hispanic groups. Um, and we have been, I think, for quite some time. No, uh, and, okay, so you, you, you specifically mentioned about one of your agendas or guiding lights to be uh, have a liaison when it comes to different nations uh, interacting and investing in United States and vice versa. Trade ties, investment ties, supply chains mm -hmm. that need to be built with nations that are conducive for the growth of the mutual growth of both United States and that particular nation and India particularly since I'm sitting out of New Delhi and would want to understand. Uh, how do you see and how do you Oversage yourself as enabling a channel to ensure that these trade ties and investment ties between India and United States will join here on, keeping in mind the current crisis that we witness in Afghanistan might also be able to impact what has been going between the two countries. Yes. So um, it's, I think, a multi layered question. I start with how do we make sure there's good communications? And they have to be front channel communications and things that happen in the open, they have to be back channels and there has to be diplomacy, all three. Um, we feel we have this unique ability and you've met other leaders from the Indian American community who have a similar ability to be able to back channel, to make sure that things that are small but important don't get blown out of proportion um, because I don't mean to say anything about the press, but sometimes we like controversy in the press. It, it generates news. We are not interested in controversy, we're interested in solutions. So how do we play that role effectively? It requires confidentiality, it requires trust. The second important piece is really building upon what's already been created. You don't start from scratch. But if India, for example, were to become a manufacturing hub and a critical piece of the supply chain, everyone aspires to this. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just saying, not just in the US and uh, in India, but in any country that, look, we need a venue in Asia, which has labor, skilled labor, facility, transportation, that can do the manufacturing, can become part of the supply chain. In order to do that, you need policies in India that are conducive to it, that protect investor rights. You need policies in the United States that don't discourage investment. So uh, if, we are, if, we're, if I'm saying anything publicly, it is, it's time to do a bilateral trade agreement. It's mm -hmm. time to codify what has already happened and say, if we have ambitious goals about growing from 150 billion to 500 billion in trade, um, and it's two ways, right? It's a two way street. We need investment policies written down, codified by governments, approved, standardized, so that there's a process and methodology in place. I truly believe that these two governments can do that and that interest is there. And it's well beyond just defense. It's really about how do we do this in the engagement in the civic sphere, as well as in the economic sphere with businesses. And there has to be a big component of it that has to do with women empowerment and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Because in the United States and in India, we are leaving women behind in the workforce. And we have to stop that here. We see it in the pandemic, what has happened. So that there's a big thrust right now in the White House to lift that issue up but also see how, how do Indians feel about this? Do we agree that it would be in the best interest of both countries to do this? Right, absolutely. And, and, and uh, also keeping in mind uh, the evolving geostrategic geopolitical situation that both nations find themselves in, uh, would that end up negatively impacting or positively impacting the economic and trade ties between, between businesses from both nations? Uh, cannot help but be a positive. Mm -hmm. cannot help. 
And I don't want to say more because I don't want to get into the uh, India's this because of some political strategic. Look, there's just a natural bond here. It can be frayed at times because we create tensions amongst ourselves. It can be enhanced. The best way to enhance it and make it long-term sustainable, and it's already a bipartisan thing. So it's not something that just one group and one party and one country feels over the other. So how do you enhance it? I think you enhance it with civic engagement, trade, women empowerment, um, stronger defense ties, but all of it in a panoply of we care about each other and each other's mutual good. If you need vaccines, I should provide it. If I need PPP, you should provide it. There should be no questions asked mm -hmm. why we are doing it. It's the right thing to do. We do it to support each other. And the same holds true when either country is facing an adversary. We should feel that we are together in that and we are communicating. So I see these as part of a larger geopolitical, but yes. mega at the end of it, it's about two human beings, two people connecting, making a bond, executing a strategy, and then seeing their children carry it out. That's what we hope we're doing. Okay, uh, that's a long road ahead, and you're forging it as you walk, uh, being the chairperson and founder of AAPI Victory Fund. I wish you all the very best with all your massive goals uh, and objectives in the future. But thank you so much, Shaker, for joining me on this very special podcast with uh, your insightful views about uh, everything related to especially the Indian American community living in the United States. Thank you, Mega. Appreciate it. Good luck to you. Thank you. Bye. NewsX ITV Network have proudly launched the Waku Diaspora Broadcasting Network. Waku DBN will be India's first mainstream platform dedicated to the diaspora community. Help support us, become Waku patrons at memboro.com slash waku. You will get the first access to our interviews, make recommendations, merchandise access, ask questions and get a shout out of thanks on our TV shows. You can also suggest to us who should get the Waku Golden Chakra Awards and also tell us who should get into the Waku Hall of Fame. Limited memberships are available at 100 rupees per month on Memboro Waku. Sign up now, log on to memboro.com slash waku.